Good afternoon, everyone. I guess everyone is well and safe and um, happy to uh, introduce our speaker, Professor Hamid Shashawan, who is uh, one of a new WIN member. And this is, I believe, one of the first of the WIN seminar that we are having this term as well. And uh, so just a brief introduction about Professor Shashawan. Professor Shashawan is currently the assistant professor in chemical engineering at the uh, university and a WIN member. He received his PhD as well as his uh, master's from Waterloo uh, and nanotechnology as well in the program and his bachelor's from Sharif University in Tehran. Uh, he has been our WIN fellow, nano fellowship uh, as a grad student. So I think it's amazing to see him uh, back in our campus as a, a faculty member uh, and a part of WIN member as well. So uh, without any further ado, I look forward to your lecture, Hamed, and welcome again. Thank you very much for having me, Shanta. Uh Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk for WIN. Uh, I used to be a student here and uh, attend these uh, WIN seminars as a student now. Uh, it's time for me to contribute and uh, uh, good to feel back home. Uh, the, the subject that I want to talk about today is uh, about small-scale robotics, uh, soft robotics, and a niche in this new field uh, about, uh, about robotic materials. And I, I actually want to focus on a very interesting material called liquid crystal networks or liquid crystalline materials for this sort of application. Uh, I start with a uh, very uh, interesting application of uh, robots these days, and it's uh, actually by a medical robot. Uh, the picture you see here is Da Vinci, which is a surgical robot, and it's very precise and very high end. As you can see, there is a uh, operator here that uh, could uh, kind of give commands to this robot, and this robot has a sort of central brain to, to operate and do sur surgery. Uh, uh, and, and, and it actually has a lot of small uh, sort of end applicators. As you can see, you can like have some sort of staple power module clippers and whatnot. So, so based on this control system that comes from a, uh, an outside operator, we can perform very uh, meticulous and very uh, delicate uh, surgery uh, operations. But uh, this system could be sometimes inven in invasive because we have grippers, we have punchers, and these sort of things. Uh, another example that I want to bring, uh, bring to attention is Atlas from Boston Dynamics. Uh, on the contrary to the Da Vinci, this humanoid is supposed to act independently, and there is no sort of uh, control room, and everything actually is inside this robot. But if we strip this robot, we're going to see a bunch of sensors, actuators, pumps, wards, circuits, and, and these sort of uh, materials are pretty, uh, and the structures are pretty rigid and uh, cannot perform delicate tasks in very confined environments. So the idea actually of the idea of medical micro robots come from a movie called Fantastic Voyage 1966. Uh, if you look at this movie, the premise of the movie was based on sending doctors inside your body to do a sort of surgery and uh, uh, minimizing the invasiveness of, for example, open surgery that uh, was traditional back then. But the idea was not, or is not actually materialized yet, but we have that uh, sort of passion to, to make it possible. So imagine if we have Da Vinci, and, uh, which is kind of very surgical, uh, precise for surgical uh, uh, task, and an independent humanoid, say for example, this Boston, and we kind of lump them and minimize the size and put them in a pill and then swallow the pill, then we can have a lot of applications out of this sort of small macro robots. 
We could have uh, telemetry applications, like we can do some sort of marking and sensing. We can have them for programmed uh, uh, or programmable structures like stents and uh, electrodes, or we can we can use them for material removal or targeted therapy. So this is the sort of drive between uh, b uh, behind the uh, macro medical macro robotics. How we could create this opportunity of doing surgery and medical tasks uh, using very little robots. So uh, we are not uh, in the beginning of this process. There are many good uh, examples uh, in the literature, and even some of them are in industry. As you can see on the left side, uh, the top corner, we have the endoscopy capsule that could uh, do biopsy and also take videos inside, for example. This is a phantom, but like the idea is to apply this in uh, real scenarios. And the other, uh, the other one is on the bottom corner is actually a video from a micro needle that is doing some sort of micro injection inside a mouse uh, mouse's eye. Uh, so. What are the challenges, benefits, and uh, applications of micro robots? We can easily uh, find applications in bioengineering and uh, microfluidics, healthcare, and micro manufacturing. But at the same time, uh, we can find a lot of benefits for this sort of uh, micro robots because we can easily make them a huge amount of them. It's, it's very low cost and they are non-invasive, and they can reach small uh, and confined areas in our body without damage. Uh, they also provide a new platform for fundamental studies at Microscale, which is actually we are mostly at this stage in the uh, research on micro robots, but it's very challenging to make them. Basically, the physics and engineering at, at that scale is non-intuitive, and they are very difficult for fabrication, uh, let alone if we want to make them like uh, many of them at the same time. Uh, also, we have problems and challenges regarding the localization and monitoring. And eventually, we want all the sensing, actuation, power, powering, comp computation, and communication units to be lumped in a very small uh, sort of construct. So uh, making robots basically at very at, at very small scale is a very challenging and a, uh, task and is a totally different story than making a big robot. All right, uh, I've shown you the humanoid that or, or, or atlas that Boston Dynamic has made, but they, we, we have a variety of different robots like from humanoid, like a human size, up to a very small size, like a sperm or something like that. And if you look at them, we have actually made them based on a sort of inspiration from the nature. Humanoid is from human, like dog, gecko, and all these sort of animals have given us enough clues to sort of replicate their uh, body, replicate their, uh, replicate their body and replicate their task. To, to make a sort of uh, robot. Uh, if we look at the differences between these two rows, we will find out that the top row that is artificial and man-made robots, uh, usually they are made of uh, made from a top-down procedure uh, by a top-down procedure. We start with a the material, then we uh, kind of carve the material to a geometry or make a geometry out of the material and then make a component and then we integrate these components to make a robot. However, in nature we have uh, cells, they self-assemble, then they undergo a sort of morphogenesis to create limbs and eventually some limbs uh, attach and create this sort of animal or biological uh, creature. As we uh, look at the both rows, we find that like most of the 
man-made robots are stiff, and there are a lot of stiff parts that have been used, or components or materials have been used in them. But in nature, as we scale down and we shrink the size, the ratio of the rigid to soft parts of the body decreases to the point that we don't have any rigidity inside our system. So if we want to go for very small robots, it's better to decrease the amount of rigid and increase the amount of soft. So basically what we need is a lot of scalable soft materials. Now, the rational design behind many of the bio-inspired soft robots uh, has been based on getting an inspiration from the nature. So we look at the nature, we find an animal, plant, or microorganism, and then we make a component out of it to do a sort of task for us, like sensing, actuating, or we want this component to uh, to, to to be a sort of a structural, uh, to give a structural uh, integrity to our system. And then we integrate these components to make a robot. However, if we look at the nature and biology, we find that most of the uh, animals, the like humans, have the cognition at both their brain and throughout their body. So it's not just like we have a computational center and that's doing the uh, cognition and perceiving for us. Rather, we have a whole body from skin and whole cells. They have some sort of intelligence. So in this sense, material and geometry itself give us some sort of uh, intelligence that helps the cognition and perception of this intelligent system. Indeed, the rational design of bio-inspired soft robots could change, and we have two components of materials and geometry. This is where uh, we actually come into picture, material scientists, and we have to come up with materials that are capable of giving us this sort of uh, embodied cognition. Now, if we use the same logic for uh, creating small robots, we need to get inspiration from smaller organisms like I don't know, sperm, bacteria, nematodes, and then we have to focus on materials that are soft, stimuli responsive, shape change programmable, and preferably biocompatible if we want to use them in science pods. The geometry should be, uh, um, we have to come up with the geometry through common macrofabrication techniques, which either are additive or subtractive. And also, we have to have ability to lump all the sensing, actuating, powering, and different sort of tasks that we want from a component into one small uh, structure that uh, that is made of this soft material. Uh, preferably, we should get rid of integration. Then we, we're going to be more inclined towards monolithic design or self-assembly of different parts. And then we, we want to also have access to multi-material microfabrication pro uh, procedures to, to increase the chances of getting closer to the nature. And eventually, the robots should be untethered and we should uh, be able to control remotely without any wire, so we could send it inside the confined area of like, our body without any difficult. So I will focus only on the material in that, like I go back to this slide, I, I only focus on the material part because I think each of these inspirations, geometry, each of these steps have their own huge field of interest, but I am mostly interested in materials for robots and especially a new class or a, I would say new trending class of robotic materials called liquid crystalline materials. Um, I think everyone knows in this uh, audience that we have many types of smart materials, uh, hydrogels, shape memory, polymers and alloys, ferroelectric polymers, to name a few, but each of them have some sort of uh, drawback, 
Some of them only work in wet conditions. Some of them have only fixed first and last shape. Some of them require very complex uh, procedures for the fabrication. Some of them give low strain, and some of them give low output energy. So uh, what we want to do, we want to eliminate as many as possible of these uh, shortcomings and come up with a material that have, has many advantages and has lower of these uh, no, lower number of these shortcomings. Now, uh, liquid crystal networks or liquid crystalline materials are one of the trendy materials. I think since 2010, they are again on the map for soft robotic materials because of many advantages they offer. For example, they offer simple fabrication uh, techniques. Uh, they offer uh, programmable shape change. They usually have a high strain and uh, reasonable output energy. We can make many monolithic uh, structures, like robots, from these materials. Also, we, we have the ability to change the shape in very complex manner simply through these materials. They are moderately priced, and most of them are sensitive to multiple stimuli. Instead of like one stimulus, we have multiple stimuli responsive materials like these uh, liquid crystal assets. Here is an example of many shape changes that you could see. We can program the material to have different shape changes, from simple bending uh, in this corner to very complex, like for example, a face-like structure or face-like shape change, as you can see here. They have diverse uh, chemistry, and uh, they, they, they have a lot of abilities that uh, material should have for uh, to be scaled down in a, uh, as a sort of uh, micro robot. Now, I'm going to explain a bit about the liquid crystal materials, the liquid crystalline materials. We have liquid crystalline networks, elastomers, gels. Uh, the the main ingredient is basically a liquid crystal molecule, and as you can see, the liquid crystal molecule is usually in between a crystal and liquid. So the phase is between the liquid and crystal. They have the order of crystals, but they have the fluidity, fluidity of liquids. The molecules themselves are sort of anisotropic, as you can see. And this anisotropic nature of the molecule gives anisotropic properties throughout the liquid crystal elastomer, elastomer gel or network. If you polymerize these sort of anisotropic molecules uh, in different ways, put them in the backbone or at the side uh, message end, then we're going to end up with liquid crystal elastomers, networks, and gels. And, and by changing the temperature and the order of these uh, anisotropic molecules, we can induce some sort of shape change, microscopic shape change. There are many stimuli that are uh, being used to to change the ordered state to disorder state and this uh, create this sort of shape change, but heat and light are the most common ones. Another important thing about the liquid crystal elastomers, gels, and networks is that we can predict the shape change by uh, predicting or designing the initial uh, molecular alignment. For example, if we have this display alignment of the molecules, then we have bending. If we have, for example, this sort of twisting of the molecules uh, throughout the thickness, we can have that sort of like satellite uh, Gaussian uh, curvature. Now, the key question that actually we're going to deal with if we, in most of the slides uh, from now on is how to create this sort of alignment or basically program the shape change. One of the simplest ways is just like mechanical stretching of a material. Imagine like we have this sort of uh, multi-domain liquid crystalline uh, elastomer. And if we want to have a sort of anisotropic properties, we have to stretch them. And then we can create this uh, aligned and uniaxial uh, alignment of the anisotropic positions. 
This is the, basically the simplest one. The other one is uh, using special surface uh, coding materials like polymers that could give command to the molecules and these molecules could uh, orient themselves in a way that that uh, command polymer has them to do. Another way is using electrical and magnetic fields. Uh, they are susceptible to have either uh, positive or negative uh, magnetic and electric uh, anisotropy. Uh, a very common and very easy technique is basically using light for alignment of the molecules. We're going to have uh, command polymers on the surface, and then we're going to do uh, sort of shining the light through mask, and then we're going to induce this sort of uh, alignment that we want. And the most recent one that we have worked on is using surface topography. Uh, this technique was very common back in the like, uh, 80s, but it was very simple by just like, rubbing something on the surface to give some sort of nano grooves to align molecules along that groove. But now because of the ability that we have for microfabrication of many different uh, structures at micro and nano scale, we can create different patterns for alignment of the molecules. So I think this one is, okay. So now I'm going to showcase uh, liquid crystal elastomer network and gels that could be used as soft robots or a part of a soft robot at different scales. I'm going to start with macro scale. And uh, I, I, I show you here a gecko that could easily attach and detach a toe pads from the surface, and this mechanism is basically uh, using macro and nano structures on the surface of the toe, and the muscle that backs up those macro nano structures for releasing the surface from uh, releasing the toe from the surface. So the mechanism of attachment is basically uh, uh, using extended uh, adhesives. And when we want to switch attachment to detachment, then we have to scroll the material, to scroll the toe. So uh, using liquid crystal elastomers, we can program the muscle, and also we can create these sort of macro structures on the surface. You can see on the right uh, corner that we could easily make this sort of muscle, uh, emulate the muscle actuation of gecko, and also have this structure, microstructure on top to act as, a, as an adhesive. Now, having this artificial gecko toe, we could also create a sort of gecko-inspired soft gripper that actually uh, mimics the attachment and detachment uh, mechanism of geckos. And as you can see, by heating up the uh, robot, we can easily induce this sort of back scrolling motion. Another example that uh, I want to show you is direct shape change programming of liquid crystal elastomers. If you remember in the uh, crash course uh, slide, one of the best ways to, and easiest ways to program the shape change is to just stretch them. And eventually you can also, uh, in the stretched condition, you can twist them or make any sort of shape that you want. And as you can see, we can program the shape change by mechanical uh, stretching or molding. Uh, the other way that we can do is we can use optical uh, ability to, to program the, uh, I would say, like optical properties. As you can see, we can start with a poly domain liquid crystal network that is not aligned, then we heat it up. Uh, the, the opacity of the poly domain system will vanish and we're going to have isotropic transparent materials. And then if we shine UV through a mask, then we could create this sort of pattern that is temperature sensitive as well. So at high temperature, we're going to have fully transparent and uh, fully transparent isotropic material. But when it's, cool, when it's cooled down, then the pattern is going to show up. 
12. The other example that is uh, fairly new is a uh, kind of combination of liquid crystal elastomers and dielectric elastomers, two big groups of smart materials that uh, were dominating the uh, literature for almost 10, 20 years. And we thought that, like, how about we change the mechanism of actuation of liquid crystal elastomers from heat and light, which are less effective or less efficient, to, to electrical uh, actuation. Dielectric elastomers, as you can see in the panel A, uh, have been used for almost 20 years now, and they basically use two electrodes laminated on top and bottom of a soft isotropic elastomer, and by applying a voltage, uh, a stress called uh, Maxwell stress will uh, uh, create inside the uh, elastomer, and then we're going to have some sort of isotropic expansion of the whole material. We thought that if we induce uh, an isotropic mechanical properties into the center or the, the, the main elastomer, then we can have an isotropic shape change or expansion instead of isotropic. So by using liquid crystal elastomers instead of isotropic elastomers like silicon, we could create this uh, material that is sensitive or is responsive to electric fill, but it actuates in a sort of program and an isotropic fashion. Now, we wanted to expand the uh, repertoire of the shape change, and we thought that like maybe we could use uh, sort of buckling to see if we could create this sort of uh, wave-like structures which was not possible through making simple uh, isotropic dielectric elastomers that used to be the case for years. We went even further, and we thought that, why not? We could, we could create these sort of Gaussian uh, curvatures by just creating these sort of disconnections, sorry, the uh, defects inside our system. So we have plus one and minus one defect in, in liquid crystal elastomer, uh, the central liquid crystal elastomer. And then as you can see in this video, by just applying the voltage, we can translate the program uh, shape change, uh, molecular program, uh, programmed molecular alignment to a macroscopic shape change, as you can see here. So the uh, actuation was very high compared to what we used to see from dielectric elastomers. And this actually is because of the anisotropic properties of liquid crystal elastomers. The second uh, category of the materials or uh, uh, examples that I want to show you is about liquid crystal gels. Uh, and they are at macro scale, and I wanted to I wanted them to use I wanted to use them uh, underwater. So uh, most of the liquid crystal elastomers and networks uh, can be actuated by light and heat, and both of them are uh, less efficient in water. Water is good because we have a high amount of dissipation, so the relaxation is faster. But at the same time, the amount of the energy we have, that we have to put into the system to create the actuation response that we want is way higher, almost 20 to 30 times higher for a, a simple and identical liquid crystal elastomer. So what we wanted to do uh, to overcome this problem of actuation inside water well, was bringing down the transition temperature bringing down the stiffness and uh, increase the strain. Also, we wanted to increase the speed of transition between liquid crystal and isotropic phases. And we wanted to have some sort of low density for liquid crystal networks, so the mobility of the system in water gets better. We got this inspiration from uh, soft body sea mollusks. And uh, I, I, I sort of studied them for a while, and I figured out that most of them use this sort of undulatory movement for uh, creation of wave-like structures 
and uh, then using these waves and undulating them, they can easily have different si types of locomotion inside the water. And this was a good uh, inspiration for me back then to, to create similar type of uh, actuation inside the water. So basically what I wanted to have was a material that is pretty soft and flexible. The density of that material should have been very low and also that material should have had a low transition temperature, preferably below 100 uh, degree, which is the boiling point of the water. And I really was interested in having sharp phase transition because we, I wanted to have fast relaxation, fast excitation. And uh, we, we used the idea of liquid crystal gels. They are pretty soft and they meet all these requirements. And as you can see in this video, we could come up with many uh, interesting uh, applications and also demos. For example, on here we have on the left side uh, top corner, we have wave formation. As you can see, if we have just like liquid crystal network, it doesn't move, but as we make the material softer and softer, we can create this uh, sort of wave-like um, locomotion or shape change. Now, if we use this material and uh, release it or uh, free it from the uh, frame, then we can have walking, as you can see, and we can have this sort of crawling. And what inspired us for swimming was the, this uh, bottom one on the right corner uh, that we could also use this material to, to jump. And uh, we, we, it was a bit baffling for us in the beginning, but then later on we figured out that the material is losing or decreasing its uh, density when you shine light. And this was actually the inspiration and the motive behind making this material swim like this. And uh, it, was, it was so interesting because we had to kind of balance the density change and also actuation. If you only have the light and decrease the density and increase the buoyancy, the material is not going to come up without this sort of flapping. And if you just have a material that can flap but does not have this buoyancy, then you're not going to have this upward swing. The last uh, topic that I want to talk about is making this liquid crystal networks small and use them at, as, at, at macro scale. Uh, I call them architectured materials because this is a new class of materials that we can combine several materials together to create a new application. And the, the interest for me is to make them sm as small as possible. The challenge for uh, fabrication uh, at micro scale is basically shape change programming. That's the bottleneck. So the, the way that we overcome this problem is to use uh, macro structured command surfaces. So basically we use command surfaces to guide the molecules to, to a direction that we want. For this, we use the fancy instrument called uh, NanoSprout, which is using two photon polymerization. And this two photon polymerization could be used, number one, to create this command surfaces, as you can see on this uh, column. And then if we use this command surfaces, we can use a non-commercial ink, for example, our own liquid crystal network called the Redis, to create uh, 3D structures, as you can see, like this uh, spring-like structure. So the command surface is commercial, and the robot itself, or the actuator itself, could be tailor-made. So using this uh, uh, state-of-the-art technique, we could create different shape change from the same geometry. On the left side, you can see we have a donut, but we have four types of alignment. And these four types of alignment will give us 
four types of shape change. For example, if you have uniform alignment on the left side, uh, you're going to have simple uh, shape change, as you can see. And then we have the twist alignment. Then for the twist alignment, the shape change is going to be different. It should be out of the plane. For the twist alignment number two, which is using a thinner uh, molecular alignment uh, confinement, we're going to have more pronounced uh, shape change. And for uh, the, the last one, we're going to have a sort of, uh, I, I don't know what we call it, but we're going to have completely uh, symmetrical swelling. For the right side, we have this coil structures, and as you can see, uh, we start with a uniform alignment, and they are supposed to just change their shape in a uniform manner, and they're going to just like uh, expand in one direction, shrink in another direction. And then when we have twist alignment, we should have a sort of bend. And on, on the third side, we're going to have the twist, but with thinner uh, confinement, so we expect to have different angle for the shape change, and eventually we use this sort of twist alignment, but with a sort of sinusoidal wave on, on one side that would make the shape to completely crumble. Now, the, the future for, for, for this research will be using these actuators as robots. For example, we can use multi-domain uh, design to create this sort of uh, robots that could uh, be active both in uh, air and water. I think for some reason the video for in water locomotion doesn't work, but uh, if you can see, we can easily actuate them by light. And if we could harvest this actuation, this fast actuation inside water, we basically could uh, have, say, for example, sperm mimetic micro robots that could use this uh, actuation for locomotion. Eventually, I uh, want to showcase like the, I think this is the, the most fresh uh, result that we have, uh, which is based on uh, hybridization of liquid crystal elastomers as artificial muscles to uh, macrocurigami structures. We came up with idea uh, to this idea with my uh, PhD student that uh, we could attach uh, macrocurigami structures to to liquid crystal elastomer networks as artificial muscles, and then use the shape change programmability and, sh and stimuli responsive shape change of liquid crystal elastomers uh, to induce opening and closing the structures, as you can see here. So we were able to um, make the kirigami on a surface of liquid crystal elastomer. And as you can see, the size was something around 100 micrometer, pretty small. Uh, we, could, we could make them completely reversible, and that was a very challenging task. Eventually, we could expand our uh, uh, unit cell and make a very large Samples, as you can see, with more unit cells. We also try to have different motifs of uh, cut, for example, level two cut or linear cut to create different sort of uh, kirigami structures. And eventually, we could sort of, it's, I wouldn't say like it's a complete application, but we could create a sort of switching behavior or like microwave propagation by heating and cooling down uh, large uh, kirigami structures. And another one was basically using this uh, the size of the cut, uh, variation of the size of the cut to the size of the cut in the background for data encryption. As you can see in the bottom line, we wanted to have, for example, a triangle embedded in the structure. In the cold, you could not see it. In hot condition, you could see this triangle. I think I'm going to finish here. Uh, I would like to thank all the contributors to, to all the work we have done here and uh, thank my collaborators and people who have helped me. Uh, 
we are fairly new in the university. Our lab is called the Smart Lab. I would like to uh, invite everyone to visit us or at our website, at least uh, because of the pandemic, and I would be happy to take any questions you have.